it's a pleasure uh, to be here and um, hope everyone's excited to learn about some colorectal awareness today. Uh, as Twin said, I'm the Associate Director of the Colorectal Cancer of Excellence at CPMC. And my area of specialty is colorectal cancer, um, as well as general surgery. So, you know, gallbladders, um, hernias, and appendixes I also operate on. And I do both robotic and laparoscopic surgery. So um, today, hopefully, we'll have a great talk and uh, look forward to any questions. And I hope you guys learn a lot. So just to start off, um, you know, so... In general, cancer, um, you know, is the abnormal division um, of unchecked cell growth. And in the colon, this is where, you know, cancer cells form when the body doesn't need them and the cells don't die off when they should. And so this is the uh, picture on the left hand part of the screen just gives you an idea of where the colon is in the body in relationship to different organs. So the colon is actually a fixed structure um, as opposed to the small intestines, which kind of float around in the abdomen. Um, the colon is also, the, so the large intestine is also known as the large bowel. And its function is to, you know, absorb water and nutrients from the food matter that comes from the small intestine, as well as eliminate waste. And so the, the colon is actually broken up into four discrete sections. Um, and you can kind of see those on the right side of the screen. It's the ascending colon, uh, which is located on the right side of the body. The transverse colon, which goes kind of from right to left across the body. And then the descending uh, colon goes into the sigmoid colon. So there's these four kind of discrete areas. Um, in women, this, the large intestine is typically five feet long, and in men, it's six. Um, and then the last six inches um, of the large intestine is known as the rectum. Um, and then the very last part um, is the anus. And even though it's very close to the rectum, the cells that line the anus are different than the ones that line the colon and rectum. And so I won't be talking about anal cancer because the treatment for that is quite different. Um, and it, the cause of anal cancer is quite different than colorectal cancer. So that won't be uh, covered in today's talk, okay? So basically, how does colorectal cancer develop? Um, and so almost always it develops from a polyp which is this non-cancerous mushroom type growth um, that occurs in the mucosa or inner lining of the colon and rectum. Up to 30 to 50% of average risk 50 year old patients will have polyps. Um, and that's why it was originally thought that, you know, that we do screening colonoscopies starting at age 50. Now less than 10% of people uh, or those polyps will develop into a cancer. And it's typically a very slow process that takes longer than 10 years. Now, polyps can be broken up both into flat, also known as sessile polyps or pedunculated polyps. And those are polyps that are on a stalk. And you can kind of see an example of those over in that picture on the right hand side. Now, polyps are based on their growth pattern. And there's two specific type of polyps that we're worried about and why we do those screening colonoscopies, because those are the ones that are precancerous and left unchecked could turn into a cancer. And so those are known as tubular adenomas or sessile serrated adenomas. There's a couple other polyps that are completely benign that we remove when we do colonoscopies, and those are known as hyperplastic or inflammatory polyps. And again, those do not have the potential to turn into a cancer. Adenocarcinoma is by far the most common type of cancer that occurs in the colon or rectum. 90%, 96% of all cancers in the colon are in adenocarcinoma. And these cancers start in cells that make the mucus that lubricates the colon and rectum. There are other less common types of cancer. You may have heard of carcinoid tumors, um, and these start from special hormone producing cells in the colon, or gastrointestinal stromal tumors, also known as GISTs. And these develop from special cells called the interstitial cells of Kajal, 
Um, and these can also occur in the colon and rectum, much less likely. Um, the most common spot for GISTs are typically in the stomach and small intestine, uh, but the third most common spot is in the rectum. And then even happening less frequent than that are lymphomas, um, which typically attack the Im immune system and start um, in lymph nodes. And then sarcomas, which are, are very rare. Um, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the stages of colorectal cancer. So once a polyp progresses to a cancer, um, it can grow into the colon and rectal wall. And then once it does that, it can spread beyond the wall and typically spread into lymph nodes, um, which are those little bean-shaped structures that typically um, help, us, help us fight infections. Or it can go into the bloodstream. Once it goes into the bloodstream, then it can typically spread Either to the liver and lungs are the most common spots for colorectal cancer to spread to once it kind of leaves the lymph nodes in the wall of the colon. The spread of cancer to cells to parts distant from where it originated is known as metastasis. And the extent to which cancer has spread at the time of diagnosis is, descri is described as its stage. And so colorectal cancer follows a TNM staging system. The T stands for thickness, and that is basically how far the cancer is growing through the wall of the colon. There are six set specific layers um, of the colon and rectal wall, and as you can see here, um, a T1 cancer kind of invades into the submucosa, a T2 invades into the muscularis propria, a T3 invades through the muscularis propria into the pericolonic tissue, meaning it's grown through basically um, the wall of the colon. And then T4 is when it penetrates to the surface um, of other organs or directly invades other organs. So as we start to stage colorectal cancer, um, we always want to look, we always want to determine the thickness um, or how deep it's going through the wall. Sometimes we're able to do that with imaging that we obtain prior to doing any sort of treatment for colorectal cancer. So as we're staging it, we need to get a CT scan. Um, and specifically for rectal cancer, we get a pelvic MRI and that can give us a good idea of how thick this tumor is going through the wall. The ultimate decision about how deep it's going is actually when the cancer has been removed and the pathologist can look at it and they can t tell us definitively how how many layers that tumor is going through. Now the N is stands for lymph nodes and that um, again was one of the first areas where cancer can spread to if it goes beyond the wall of the colon. Um, Sometimes imaging studies can give us an idea if the lymph nodes are involved, but again, we cannot definitively say cancer is in lymph nodes based on imaging studies. It has to be once the, the cancer has been removed and the lymph nodes are often removed with that specimen and the pathologists take a look at it underneath the microscope to tell us. And then M stands for metastasis. And again, that is spread of the cancer beyond the colon itself to other organs. And the imaging studies are very helpful in telling us that. So for colon cancer, a CT scan that includes our chest and our abdomen and our pelvis will tell us if the, the cancer has spread to our lungs or our liver, again, are the most common spots. And then for rectal cancer, a pelvic MRI is very um, important in staging. Other workup for staging colorectal cancer um, includes blood work that looks at certain tumor markers to see if they're elevated or not. Um, and then a colonoscopy obviously is kind of the starting point because that's often where um, these cancers are first identified. So, Again, I just kind of wanted to go over the, the stages um, of colon cancer. And so stage one um, is where the cancer is invading into the muscularis propria. Um, and that was that T2 level on the previous slide. Five year survival for patients who have stage one cancer is very good, 94%. Stage two, cancers invade through the muscularis propria 
and the serosa to the pericolonic tissue. Again, um, stage one and two are basically localized disease, meaning that the cancer is staying within the, the colon itself and five years survival there. Um, again, good, 82%. Stage three um, is regional disease, meaning that the cancer has spread beyond the wall of the colon and involves the lymph nodes. And five-year survival there is 71%. And for stage four disease, that would be spread beyond the colon itself to different organs, livers, lung, um, and 14%. So the most important predictor of survival is the stage at diagnosis. And you can tell, you know, it's very important to catch this cancer at low stages, stage one and two, um, because five-year survival is, is so good. Um, but only 37% of all colorectal cancers are diagnosed at this stage. The remaining 63% of patients um, come to the doctor when the disease has spread beyond the wall of the colon or rectum to distant parts of the body. And so that's why it's just so imperative um, to do the screening test that we're going to talk about because, again, this is a very um, both preventable disease and if caught early, very treatable. So next we're going to review the symptoms of colorectal cancer. Um, early colorectal cancer often doesn't have symptoms. And again, that's just one of the important parts about why we want to do screening. Um, but some things to look out for, rectal bleeding, um, blood in the stool or toilet after having a bowel movement, dark or black stools, changes in your bowel habits or changes in the caliber, caliber of your stool. So either narrowing of the stool or some people often um, complain of diarrhea and constipation, abd abdominal cramping or pain, the urge to have a bowel movement, even though you've already emptied your bowels, constipation or diarrhea that lasts for more than just a few days, a decreased appetite, an unintentional weight loss. So if you're, you know, not dieting or working out, but you're, you're losing weight and you don't understand why. Um, and then blood loss from cancer can cause anemia, which is kind of a low number of red blood cells that your doctor can test for. And this can man often manifest as weakness, fatigue, and, and shortness of breath. And so oftentimes it would trigger a colonoscopy um, or a recommendation to see a gastrointestinal doctor or a colorectal surgeon um, to figure out why your blood counts are low. So colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer um, behind breast for women and prostate for men and then lung is the second most. So it's a very common cancer. Um, as you can see here, kind of the estimated new cases here in the US in 2020. Um, there's about 140 plus thousand cases per year um, and 50,000 deaths per year, leading to it being the third leading cause of cancer related deaths. Approximately 4.4% of men are 1 in 23, or 4, and 4.1% 4 of women are 1 in 25 will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer in their lifetime. So there are several factors that influence the risk of colorectal cancer. One being sex. Um, colorectal cancer rates are 30% higher in men than in women. Um, and like many types of cancer, um, the risk of colorectal cancer increases with age. As you can see in this graph here, um, for every subsequent five-year age group, the incident rate doubles to about age 50, and then it increases by 30% each year following that. Um, the median age of diagnosis of people with colorectal cancer is around 66 years of age. Other important factors that play in um, to getting colorectal cancer is family history. You have an increased incidence of if you have a first degree relative, uh, meaning, um, you know, sibling, children, 
parents um, geography. There's a higher incidence of colorectal cancer in the Western world. Um, and then your eth the ethnicity also plays um, a factor. There's actually a higher incidence um, in the US Jewish population, um, but greater mortality in African Americans. So in general, um, starting since the 1980s, there's been a significant decline in colorectal cancer mortality. And you know, we think this is because of the huge push um, of doing screening colonoscopies and getting the word out that, um, that helps prevent colorectal cancer. There's been a, you know, two, close to a two and a half annual decrease in the incidence over the last 10 years, as well as a 2.4, percent annual decrease in the mortality. Um, and there's been a more rapid decline in women and we're not exactly quite sure why. We don't know if hormones play a role in that. Um, but in general, um, there, there has been a decline um, in colorectal cancer related deaths. Now, I just want to go over some of the, the risk factors uh, for developing colorectal cancer. There's both non-modifiable risk factor, meaning inherited, there's nothing you can do about it, um, and modifiable risk factors, so uh, risk factors that you can change. Um, in the United States, more than half of all colorectal cancers are attributable to lifestyle factors, um, including unhealthy diets, insufficient physical activity, high alcohol consumption, um, and smoking. And these traditionally have been associated with high income countries. And that's why often the Western states have a higher incidence of colorectal cancer. So first we'll kind of go over the non-modifiable risk factors or risk factors um, that are inherited. And that the biggest one is family history. So as we, I touched on before, people with a first degree relative, so a parent, sibling, or child who have been diagnosed with colorectal cancer have a two to four times increased risk of developing cancer. And then the most common hereditary risk factor for colorectal cancer is Lynch syndrome, which accounts for 3% of all colorectal cancers. And people with Lynch syndrome are also at increased risk for many other cancers, um, including endometrial, ovarian, small intestine, the stomach, the bladder, and breast cancer. And these individuals have a mutation um, in a certain gene that basically hinders or affects the gene's ability um, to correct errors that occur when the cells um, are dividing. There's also polyposis syndrome. Um, this accounts for 1% of colorectal cancers. And then BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations account for less than 1% of colorectal cancers. Medical history. So people who have chronic inflammatory bowel disease, um, often most associated with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis have double the risk of colorectal cancer. Um, this is basically an autoimmune um, condition that affects the GI tract from the mouth all the way through to the rectum. And um, it's in a constant inflammatory state. So the risk of developing cancer um, is determined by the extent of your disease, the severity, and for the duration. The longer that you've had it, um, and if it's more severe, the higher the risk of developing colorectal cancer. So patients with inflam inflammatory bowel disease are surveyed um, with colonoscopies much more frequently than the general population. There's been some studies to show that actually type two diabetes puts you at higher risk. And then H. pylori is a specific bug that can grow in the intestine it's most common in the stomach and often associated with gastric ulcers, but there's, we are trying to do some more research now in identifying certain strains of H. pylori that put you at higher risk um, for developing colorectal cancer. So the modifiable risk factors, uh, and these are the risk factors that 
we have a chance to intervene on um, and make a difference. Many studies have shown that most physically active people actually have a 25% lower risk of developing colorectal cancer than people that are less active. People who are sedentary, so spend most of their time on the couch watching TV, have a 25 to 50% risk of colorectal cancer. However, people who are more sedentary, who become active later in life, may actually reduce their risk. So it's something that you can improve, um, which is good to hear. We can get up and work out. Uh, the recommendations are to engage in at least 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity activity or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous activity a week. Being overweight or obesity puts you at higher risk for colorectal cancer. So obese men have a 50% higher risk of colorectal cancer and a 25% higher risk of rectal cancer. Obese women, the risk has been put close to 10% for colon cancer. And interestingly, no increased risk for rectal cancer. We think that it's the central fat, um, so the abdominal fat, um, that actually puts us as increased risk. Our diet, so eating processed sugars, refined carbohydrates, white bread, pizza dough, um, puts, it at, puts people at increased risk as well as red meat. Smoking, um, not surprisingly, a 50% increase in colorectal cancer risk as compared to non-smokers. Uh, alcohol consumption, so greater than three drinks a day has also been associated with the 25% higher risk. And then interestingly, NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory type medication or aspirin, um, has actually been shown to lower the risk of colorectal cancer but it has to be balanced with the risk of taking the non-steroidal every day, um, which can put us at higher risk for ulcers. And so, um, you know, if you need to take an aspirin more from a cardiac standpoint, that's okay, but we're not, we're not pushing at this point taking non-steroidals um, on a daily basis to prevent colorectal cancer, just because the, the risks may outweigh the benefits of this medication. Also vitamin D, Folate and calcium um, have also been shown to actually have some protective effect against colorectal cancer. I wanted to make this kind of bold and out there because this has been a change. It's been kind of hammered into us that starting at age 50 is when we should start get screening. But um, we've seen in the last five years, I would say, a 22% increase in colorectal cancer in young patients aged 35 to 45. And we're not quite sure why, but it's really scary. And so um, in 2018, the American Cancer Society and the other societies have followed now. Um, so the Gastrointestinal Society and my society, the uh, uh, American Society of Colorectal Surgeons, have now changed the screening guidelines to recommend that adults ages 45 and older undergo regular screening with high sensitivity stool-based studies or visual examination, meaning a colonoscopy. Now the age to initiate colorectal screening was lowered um, because of this increased rate um, in younger patients. We're still working with insurance companies to have them cover these colonoscopies. Um, we're working to educate them, lawyers um, and lawmakers, um, on the importance expanding it to this younger age group so that we can help prevent it. Because again, um, if it's caught early and then five, survival is much improved as opposed to if it's caught at a later stage. Um, and so this is just a, a big change that I want to make sure that's out there to everyone. So 45 now for screening colonoscopies. This slide is busy and has a lot of information, um, but it basically covers all the screening tests out there. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this screen and you know, feel time to kind of peruse it and take it all in. 
Um, so for the recommended colorectal screening tests, the gold standard um, is a colonoscopy, both because it's diagnostic, meaning we can identify polyps, and that's what we're looking for, because that's what colorectal cancer develops from, and therapeutic, meaning we can take care of those polyps at the time of the colonoscopy. It examines the entire colon and rectum. Um, again, we go all the way around um, to where the small intestine hooks into the large intestine. Um, and the limitations with it, I understand, you know, it, 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 the bowel prep can be um, kind of the, what makes people hesitate to sign up to do a colonoscopy. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's worth the prep um, to take away those polyps before they turn into a cancer. Um, they, they can, it can be expensive, but again, most insurance companies um, cover colonoscopies. Um, you do have to go to a center and you get some sedation. So you have to have somebody um, be able to come pick you up, which can be a burden. Um, there are some companies out there, some cab companies actually, that will drive patients home. Um, so don't let that um, be an obstacle for you to, to go get uh, a screening test. You do typically have to miss a day of work. Um, the prep starts late in the afternoon. So the day before you don't need to take off, but the day of your procedure, you often have to. Um, and then the, it does carry the highest risk as opposed to the other screening tests, um, but it's, it's very low, um, very low risk of bleeding um, or putting a hole into the colon. Now the next you may have heard, it, heard of is this colonography, uh, CT colonography. It's basically a virtual colonoscopy. Um, and these are usually reserved for patients who um, can't get a colonoscopy for some reason or a colonoscopy was not, cannot complete a colonoscopy uh, for one reason or another. Sometimes people have very twisty colons, which makes it very difficult to get the colonoscope all the way through. Um, and you don't want to risk injuring someone. And so sometimes you might do a CT colonography. Um, there's no sedation. You do still have to do a bowel prep. Um, the only thing is if the CT colon colonography is positive, then typically a colonoscopy is warranted. Um, and it's recommended if it was negative to have a repeat one in five years. Um, I forgot to say in the, for the colonoscopy, if you um, have a clean exam, meaning that no polyps were found, um, then typically you can go 10 year interval between colonoscopies. If you have a family history of colorectal cancer or polyps were found, uh, the, that will shorten the amount of time uh, that you need a repeat colonoscopy. Flexible sigmoidoscopy um, is not typically recommended as a screening tool all by itself. Um, you could often do a flexible sigmoidoscopy with a stool um, test. Because the sigmoidoscopy only gets to that sigmoid colon, which is extends about up to 30 centimeters from the anus. And so you're just looking at that left side of the colon. And so um, it's not advisable just to get a flexible sigmoidoscopy because you're missing a majority of the colon and polyps could be on, in the transverse colon or on the right side. Um, typically for a flexible sigmoidoscopy, you do not need to do an entire bowel prep. Um, it's often just enemas. Um, and it's recommended if that were to be clean, uh, no polyps to get one in five years, but again, in conjunction with a stool test. Now the, the first stool test um, is known as the FIT test. Uh, and this uses antibodies against hemoglobin to specifically detect um, human blood in stool. And it's twice as likely as the fecal occult blood test um, to detect advanced adenomas or cancers. And, um, you know, this is a little bit simpler. Um, you can do it at home. It's not invasive. Um, although it does require multiple samples in order to be, um, to, to hit the sensitivity and specificity requirements. 
um, it will often miss polyps. And so I just, I want to stress that all of the stool tests will often miss advanced polyps. Um, and unfortunately, you know, those are the ones that are going to turn into a colorectal cancer. If you're, if they turn a, if the test turns positive, you do need a colonoscopy. If negative, uh, it's recommended that you do one every year. And I, I would recommend that the, you do the fit stool tests over the fecal occult blood test. Um, they have a higher chance of detecting the blood in your stool with the fit test as opposed to the fecal occult blood test. And then the last one is the Cologuard, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. There's been a lot of, you know, commercials. Um, and this is a good test. Um, again, you know, you don't need a bowel prep. Um, it can be done at home and it only requires a single sample. Um, again, it will miss polyps and the false positive results are high. Um, it's recommended if this were negative that you get a, uh, do a repeat one in three years. Um, so again, the gold standard um, is a colonoscopy. So then, you know, treatment of colorectal cancer, the mainstay of treatment is surgery, especially for um, the lower stages of colon cancer. You know, if it hasn't spread elsewhere, we typically start with surgery. And now surgery is typically performed robotically um, or laparoscopically, so minimally invasive, um, great results, um, you know, low complication rates and um, staying in the hospital for a sh much shorter amount of time than, than the open procedure. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure that your, your surgeon is adverse and robotic or minimally invasive surgery because that's kind of the, the gold standard for treating many colon and rectal cancers. Now, sometimes people need chemotherapy, and for, for colon cancer, it's typically um, based on lymph node involvement. So, again, surgery is typically where we start for colon cancer. If it's, you know, stages in the early staging process and hasn't spread elsewhere, and then if you need chemotherapy, it'll be based typically on if lymph nodes were involved. And again, we only know that once the tumor has been removed and the pathologist can take a look at the specimen. Um, for, for rectal cancer, depending on the thickness of the tumor, or if we think lymph nodes may be involved based on imaging studies, so there's a suspicion for it, sometimes people will get chemotherapy and radiation up front, then followed by surgery, and then followed by more chemotherapy. Um, and so, you know, the 5-FU or Zolota and oxaliplat oxaliplatin is the typical chemotherapy regimen that we give for colorectal cancer, also known as Folfox. Um, and if you do get it, it's typically 12 cycles, which is about six months worth of chemotherapy after surgery. Um, now for, we're trying to use more targeted therapies for cancers as well. And so if people have specific mutations in their cancer, um, then there are targeted therapies that will attack those certain mutations and give people a better chance at a disease-free disease survival and better prognosis. And then something exciting kind of out there now is immune therapy. This is not, this is not used for earlier stages of cancer, but it's basically using our own immune system to fight cancers. Um, and so this is, um, there are a couple immunotherapies that are available uh, for colorectal cancer. And again, radiation is typically reserved for rectal cancer, as I said, um, or more advanced colon cancer. So if the cancer has invaded into the abdominal wall, sometimes we'll, we'll use radiation. But in general, it's just chemotherapy for colon cancer. And then sometimes it's chemotherapy and radiation for rectal cancer. 
And then I, you know, I just wanted to touch base on some of the exciting areas um, of research that are out there right now. Um, you know, we're, people are looking at um, and evaluating why certain colorectal cancers kind of evade or resist our, chemo, our traditional uh, chemotherapies. Um, we're exploring ways to prevent colorectal cancer by investigating or manipulating the gut microbiome. So some people are looking at specifically the bacteria um, in the colon and rectum, and they found that a certain type of bacteria, specifically one called fusobacterium, is seen more in patients with colon and rectal cancer as opposed to not. And so they're starting to investigate if they can eliminate this bacterium from our gut, if that would help prevent uh, colorectal cancer. So that's kind of really exciting. Um, you may have heard of liquid biopsies. And so this is actually looking um, at blood and urine samples to detect uh, DNA and other substances that cancer cells can shed, uh, shed into the, the bloodstream or urine and basically see if we can detect early cancers that way. People are looking into vaccines, specifically in the Lynch syndrome population. So being able to give antibodies to attack certain proteins um, that are amiss or awry in that patient population. And then we're you know, still trying to understand the barriers to the colonoscopy and screening. Just there are so many people that don't have the opportunity um, and why we're missing certain populations. Um, and so there's a lot of research going into how we can um, increase that number because, you know, again, screening and early identification are key. And then, you know, I kind of wanted to spend just a little bit of time um, letting everyone know that here at uh, CPMC, we um, are accredited by the National Accreditation Program for Rectal Cancer. So we're a center of excellence. Um, there's actually, we were the ninth center to, to get accredited and there's actually only 16 centers across the country that have this accreditation. Um, and it took a lot of hard work to, to get there and a lot of people to make that happen. Um, but we're the only institution in the Bay Area that's actually a uh, rectal cancer center of excellence. Um, and we're just committed uh, to the ensuring our patients, you know, the highest quality um, for colorectal cancer. And we have a lot of support systems um, to help people um, and the burden that comes along with that disease. Just to kind of highlight um, what, what part of being a center of ex excellence um, means is that, you know, if you are diagnosed with a colorectal cancer, we actually discuss your case at a at a tumor board with um, many different disciplines involved from surgeons to medical and radiation oncologists to pathologists, um, you know, geneticists, nurse navigator, uh, making sure that, you know, we're, we're recommending the, the best uh, treatment um, plan for you. Um, we have a survivorship program, which kind of summarizes uh, the care patients have re received and educates them about the best uh, way to manage their cancer in the future. All patients, uh, all surgical patients at CPMC participate in an enhanced recovery after surgery program. And, and this is a specific program to minimize narcotics, um, it's been shown to decrease the length of stay and decrease complications. Um, and so, you know, patients are not starved anymore. We feed them immediately coming out of the operating room. Um, we get rid of tubes and drains as quick as possible. Um, and we get people up and moving the day of surgery just because we, it's been shown that 
lying in bed is um, not helpful and doesn't help stimulate the intestines. And so we, we have this, this program that um, has been really great um, and everyone is on board at CPMC from the nursing staff to the physicians. Um, and it, it's really been shown to, to have excellent outcomes for our patients. And then we're very fortunate to have um, a specific GI cancer um, nurse that works with patients to, you know, improve their experience um, and help them along the way um, through this really um, challenging and at times scary process, um, helping educate them on their the stage of their disease and what surgery will entail and what to expect um, in the recovery process. And so um, this is a really great resource that we have. Also at CPMC, um, we participate in the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. Um, so we, um, along with hundreds of other institutions around the country provide our data to look at areas where we can improve or where um, we have success and be able to share that. Um, and by being able to participate in this program, um, again, we're able to identify areas that we might be able to improve on. Um, and it's really nice to be able to compare ourselves to other like um, institutions. And then here at CPMC, we're our colorectal patients are also able to participate in an avatar research project um, where their specific tumor can be placed inside a certain type of model um, and tested with different chemotherapy agents to see if their tumor would respond better to one agent over another, um, which can be really helpful in patients where they have a specific mutation um, or it's more aggressive or advanced. Um, and this, this can play a role in hopefully um, giving them more targeted chemotherapy agents that would attack their specific tumor. And then, you know, I, you just in conclusion to kind of bring everything together, you know, colorectal cancer is a, is a common uh, cancer that can cause a significant number of deaths, but again, caught early um, is very treatable. Modern chemotherapy agents continue to improve survival for, for patients with more advanced stages. So um, those are those targeted therapies I was talking about that will attack the certain um, mutations in certain genes um, and the immunotherapy is new medications that are coming out um, to attack cancer. So this is a big area um, of ongoing research, but we've made significant headway in, in attacking this, this malignancy. And then it's really important um, to be involved in a, in a cancer treatment plan with a, with a big team um, of healthcare experts that can provide the best care for patients with colorectal cancer. So you wanna make sure that your team involves the surgeons, the medical oncologists, the radi radiologists, pathologists, nurse navigators, ostomy nurses, um, and genetic counselors um, is really important. So um, that's, that's all I have for you guys. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have or comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Talbot. One of the questions was more about diet. Um, does a high sodium diet affect risk and why, why or how, I guess? <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, not so much of a so high sodium diet um, that would typically affect more of you know the effect on the blood vessels and po possibly hypertension um, but we do know that a diet high in fruits and vegetables um, and low in you know those processed sugars you want to avoid red meats um, or specifically nitrites which can be found in um, kind of like beef jerkies um, 
those are what have, have been shown to increase the risk of colorectal cancer, but not specifically um, high sodium. Another question I received was, is it recommended um, or, yeah, is it recommended to get a colonoscopy sooner than 45 or, yeah, younger? Yeah, so um, if you're having specific symptoms, um, so, you know, rectal bleeding, weight loss, abdominal pain um, that cannot be attributable to um, other causes. Sometimes a colonoscopy is warranted earlier, so um, for symptoms. And then for if you, unfortunately, you know, if you have inflammatory bowel disease, um, we start screening at a much earlier age. Um, in the early 20s. If you have a family history of colorectal cancer um, in a first degree relative, you typically want to start 10 years before um, the age that that person was diagnosed with a cancer. So there are definitely um, reasons why you would have a, col a screening colonoscopy earlier than age 45. But age 45 now is is, is the recommendation for average risk individuals that are not having any sort of symptoms or do not have a family history of colorectal cancer. So you're, does, does having diverti diverticulosis increase the chances of developing colorectal cancer? So that's a good question. So, you know, diverticulosis is a certain benign condition um, affecting the colon. And that's where these little outpocketings or weaknesses can occur in the colon wall. Um, those have not been shown to increase your risk of, of colorectal cancer. Um, those little outpocketings, also known as ticks, they can get inflamed. And so the inflammatory process of diverticulosis is known as diverticulitis. Um, again, this is a, a benign condition and does not put you at increased risk for colorectal cancer. Um, but about a large majority of people have diverticulosis, which is the little outpocketings. Less than 10% of patients will have diverticulitis, which is actually the infection that can occur from those little outpocketings when they, when they perforate. During my last colonoscopy, one polyp was removed and I was diagnosed with hemorrhoids. A non-surgical hemorrhoid removal treatment was recommended. Can you comment on such treatment in this particular in this particular system. One, it would be good to know, you know, make sure you know what type of polyp was removed during your colonoscopy. Again, the adenomas, so the tubular adenomas or the sessile serrated adenomas are those precancerous polyps. And that will decrease the time until your next colonoscopy. Typically, if one or two of those polyps are found, it's recommended that you have a repeat colonoscopy in five years. If more than two of those type of polyps were found, it's typically recommended that you have a follow-up colonoscopy in three years. Now, hemorrhoids, um, we all have hemorrhoids. Um, there are little cushions of blood vessels and soft tissue that line the inside and the outside of the anal canal. And in internal hemorrhoids um, can, and now, Hemorrhoids be can become symptomatic, meaning they become enlarged, and the blood vessels be can become engorged, and they can bleed easily, and that's when the, the hemorrhoids become symptomatic. Typically, surgery to remove hemorrhoids is a last resort uh, because it is one of the most painful operations I do. It causes more pain than taking out your colon or your rectum. There are just a ton of nerve endings down in the anal rectal area. So Typically, first-line treatment for enlarged or bleeding internal hemorrhoids um, is doing something called injection sclerotherapy. So we use a sclerosing agent um, and actually inject the hemorrhoids with this, and it causes them to shrivel up. Or you may have heard of rubber banding. So we can apply rubber bands um, in the office to tie off those enlarged blood vessels and cause that tissue to kind of slough off and not be so engorged. Um, both injection sclerotherapy and rubber band ligation can be performed in the office safely without pain uh, because internal hemorrhoids lie above 
a level of sensation in the anal canal. If there's any problems with external hemorrhoids, those are not treated the same way because of the nerve endings that are associated with the outside of the anus often requires numbing agents um, before any sort of procedure is performed. I have another question here. Um, could you elaborate more on why a sedentary lifestyle can lead to colon cancer? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for the, the most part, sedentary lifestyle, typically um, a lot of people are, then leads to obesity, I think, um, is the thought process that um, why not getting up and, you know, circulating our the oxygen and um, that sedentary lifestyle is often associated with obesity um, and that um, not exercising um, and getting enough oxygen to all of our um, organs um, also increases the risk of free radicals circulating in the bloodstream and um, that can um, potentially have an effect um, on damage to cells and leading to, uh, to cancer. I have one last question. Um, it's, um, if a person is diagnosed early and receives surgery, does their life change, does their life changes after that? Um, for example, long-term effects resulting from the disease or the treatment? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, you know, I get, um, asked this all the time, you know, so, the, when we have to remove a portion of your, your colon, um, the body is amazing um, in the way that's able to adapt. And so um, depending on what portion of your colon is removed um, can sometimes have an influence on the number of bowel movements you may have and the frequency, meaning how many times you're gonna go um, or the consistency, how loose the stools are. The closer to the anus that, uh, that is removed, so um, if the rectum is removed or um, the lower part of the sigmoid colon, that can um, have long-term changes in bowel function because the rectum often acts as a reservoir to help store stool. Um, and if you're removing that, then um, there's a higher likelihood that you're going to go more frequently. If other portions of the colon are removed, the, 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 the colon that's left behind will actually, um, you know, pick up for the colon that was taken out. And in general, um, most people may have somewhere between one to three more bowel movements and they can tend to be a little bit on the looser side. Um, but over time and with adding fiber supplements, um, you can get back to very close to, to the habits that you had before. Um, and then, you know, typically for, you know, if chemotherapy is needed, there are side effects that are associated with each sort of chemotherapy regimen, but um, such as oftentimes people can get like a neuropathy. Hair loss is not typically associated with um, colorectal cancer treatment. Um, you know, diarrhea, those things typically can get better um, with the cessation or completion of the, the chemotherapy so that it's not a lifelong um, disability. Thank you so much, Dr. Talbot. Uh, that was the last question that I had um, that I have that I collected throughout the lecture. Um, but on the note of colorectal cancer awareness and um, what Dr. Talbot mentioned earlier about diet lifestyle being a big factor in um, increasing or decreasing the risk of colorectal cancer, um, Community Health Resource Center at CHRC, where, um, where, this, where I work, is um, houses um, registered dietitians who are very well trained in medical nutrition therapy. They work with doctors and their patients. They work to develop um, 
therapy centered around cancer diets or um, digestive health, uh, or you can talk to your doctor about referring you to, um, to get counseling services for your diet um, or general nutrition. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Talbot. Oh, thank you so time. much for having me. This was great.